If you would, turn with, your, uh, with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And by the way, uh, you can be seated. And uh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm not Andy. If any of you didn't notice, he's he's a lot smaller than I am now. He has a lot ha less hair than I do. But um, I'll be preaching for him today. And I haven't preached on a while on a, on a Sunday morning, about four or five years probably. So so bear with me. But um, if you if you've made your way to Joshua, let's go ahead and read that text. And it says, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So let us pray today. Father God, I do thank you, Lord, for this day that we can come to your house and, and proclaim your name. Father, I just pray that uh, our hearts are open and our minds are open today, Father. Uh, God, I just pray that you would use these words to, to reach people. And Lord, I just pray that you would just forgive us where we fail you and help us to worship you and love you today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. So today, I, I, what I'm preaching on, it's kind of hard, and I promise you I struggle with this. Um, I'm not up here on some kind of soapbox. Please do not think I am perfect. Uh, I, re I have to rely on God and trust in the blood of Jesus. And I have to remember that this life is progress, not perfection. Uh, today we'll be jumping around in the Bible a little bit, so please keep it open and ready. Uh, but I wanted to start today with a little story about a pig and a hen in a barnyard. And they heard that the church was having a program to feed uh, the hungry. So the hen and the pig discussed how they could help. And the hen said, I got it. They said, we can give the bacon and eggs to feed the hungry. Well, the pig thought about this for a minute, and he said, you know, he said, that on your part, it only uh, requires a contribution, but on my part, it's total commitment. So commitment is the state of quality or being dedicated to a cause or an activity. And Joshua was committed to obeying God. He was a great general. He was a spy. He was one of only two adults that experienced Egyptian slavery and the promised land. Joshua was a constant shadow of Moses, and that's how he learned. Joshua didn't simply contribute to the Exodus, he was committed to it. And Joshua challenged Israel to commit themselves to God. And Joshua also affirmed his commitment to God and his family's commitment to God. So a few things I want to talk about this morning is personal commitment to God, your family's commitment to God, and can you commit to God? So... Most of you probably know that I teach a youth class on Wednesday night with Amy. And right now we're on the book of James. And the book of James is a great tool for pointing out our shortcomings as Christians. So anytime that we think we got this whole Christian life thing down, if we go to James, we'll figure out real quick we do not. Um, if you read James, you'll figure out that we just, there's always more we can always be better we can always go further so but one thing james talks about is the double-minded man being unstable in all his ways so having one's soul or mind divided between god and the world is not a good place to be people still think that they can be a christian and somehow uh, still love the world and that's not what god wants god demands total commitment from his children when we don't commit ourselves completely to God, we're saying, God, I'm not sure that your way is the best. Uh, if God's words or commands simply become an option to us or we treat God's way or word as advice or something we can just simply take a look at and take it under consideration with other options, other choices, that's not being committed to God. God is trustworthy and we need to commit ourselves to him. And to be committed Christians, we have to do a few things. First, we have to respect God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And maybe you are a new Christian or maybe you've been one for a while. Either way, you are to be making progress in your walk with Jesus. 
we have to start somewhere, and a good place to start is by respecting God. God knows all. God can do all. God is even outside of time. He is not uh, bound by time like we are. He is everywhere. Uh, and none of us can do that. None of us can be that. Christians, we are free to put our faith in God that has all of this and more. He is worthy of our respect and our obedience. To be committed Christians, we have to be hearing and doing. If we profess to believe in God, it doesn't end with us saying we just simply believe in Jesus and live in a life apart from God. We commit ourselves to the Word of God. We hear the Word of God and put it into effect. We will be doers of the Word. If you roll in here on Sunday morning and just simply listen to the, um, the preacher talk, that, that's not what makes you a Christian. Now, let me be clear. Church is a great thing, but faith produces fruit. It produces works. It produces commitment. It produces love. And to be a committed Christian, you have to love God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land of which you are going over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God and your son and your son's son by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. So let me ask you today, how do you show someone you love them? Uh, it's kind of easy for us. I mean, I, I like to give people presents. I really like to get presents. Uh, but you can express love through material objects. That's not the only thing love is, by the way, but you can do that. You can give material objects to someone you love, towards a spouse, family, friends, whoever. Um, but with God, you really can't express your love in a material way. You have to express it in obedience and in commitment. Jesus said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them... He it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, I want to be clear. O obedience is the result of love. Obeying commands is how we show our love, how we show our salvation, not how we receive our salvation. God loved us first, and he proved it. When he sent his Son to die on the cross for our sin, and if you are a Christian... You were bought by the blood of Jesus. Jesus was committed to his Father's plan. And the Bible says in Philippians, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So true love towards God demands obedience. It demands sacrifice. And Jesus took it upon himself to do this for you. His love for you resulted in his suffering and his sacrifice and he paid a debt that we could not pay. He said, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So ask yourself this morning, am I personally committed to God? Do I respect God? Do I receive God's word and put it into action? And do I love God? And do I do these things that show uh, that I am a child of God? So it's not easy to be committed to God. Uh, for those of us that have families, it's uh, particularly parents and especially husbands and fathers, we have a duty to spiritually, spiritually lead our family. Now the Bible does establish the husband's authority. So now... Here's the disclaimers. So don't run home and demand your wife start cooking and cleaning and, and mowing the yard and bringing you supper and you quit work and she goes to work. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. So don't go home and Jason said that I 
said that I can tell my wife what to do because that's not what I'm saying. Uh, if you do that in my house, you'll get the look from Amy. So that's not what I'm saying, and that's not what the Bible is saying. Ephesians chapter 5 does say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, uh, cleanse her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to the church himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So if I could just bear out a few things there. A man should be willing to sacrifice everything for his wife. Uh, your wife should be of your utmost importance. John MacArthur, the uh, pastor, said, Though the husband's authority has been established, the emphasis moves to supreme responsibility of husbands in regard to their wives which is to love them with the same unreserved, selfless, and sacrificial love that Christ has for his church. Christ gave everything he had, including his own flesh, for the sake of his church. And that is the standard of a sacrifice for a husband's love of his wife. So today, wives, if, if your husband cares for you as Christ cares for the church, you have a good man. You should have no fear in following a godly man because a man who's committed to God, a man who puts God first, will love you. He will support you more than any other kind of man in the world. So husbands, commit yourself to God first. This is the best way for you to love your wife. Just as Jesus committed himself to the Father's plan first, that was the best way for Jesus to love the church. So he, Jesus, put God first to love his bride the best. And that is a model we can follow when it comes to loving our wives. To put God first to love your bride the best. To love your family the best. So if you remember, Joshua said, for, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, you know, Proverbs talks about cha training a child up in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. So there's only really one way for us to go as Christian, and that is God's way. Now, yes, we should show our children love. We should teach them hobbies and sports and to work. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. There's nothing wrong with those things. But we live in a culture today that puts those things in a very high place. And it allows the things of God to fall by the wayside. So parents, we have to consistently and constantly bring God to bear in our children's lives. To teach uh, our children about God who loves them and a Savior who died for them. Parents must insist on God's way of life. They must insist on teaching God's word and, and enforcing it with a consistent loving discipline. So in Deuteronomy, back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, we didn't read verses 7 through 9. And in those verses, we'll start in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 6 of Deuteronomy. And it says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down. And when you rise, you shall bring them as a... Or, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So it says we will diligently teach our children. We have a responsibility of raising our children in a godly way. So I'm not saying, you know, take them on vacation, make memories. Everybody knows I like to go on vacation. Uh, teach them to play sports. Teach them to work, and those things are good. They really are, but they're not as good as God is. And that's one of the lessons that I, I've, I've taught youth for a long time now, about 12 years, I think. Uh, and that's one of the things I've taught them 
is to not forget about God and His Word. I know we get busy doing other things, and we just kind of forget about God. And it's, it's not right. Jesus deserves first place. Jesus is not an obscure uh, high school classmate that you talked to one time 30 years ago or a little longer for some of us, I'm sure. But, you know, he is king. He's not someone you talked to a long time ago, one time, and then you just forget about him. You have to, um, to follow him. He's deserving of our glory and of our praise. And if you're a Christian, it's, it's really not optional to do those things. So do not forget about God. Do not forget to love your wife in a Christ-like way. And do not forget to teach your children about God. And this brings me to my final point. Can you commit to God? So to be a committed Christian, you first have to be a Christian. Uh, if you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. So some of you have probably heard my testimony. Most of you probably haven't. But anyway, 20 years ago, uh, this year, I was saved. So you know, the, the funny thing was, though, 20 years ago, I thought I was saved before I got saved. Um, 30 years ago, when I was 14, I walked down the aisle of a, a Baptist church in Slaughters, Kentucky, and I thought because I walked down that aisle and uh, kneeled down that somehow that bravery made me a Christian because I was brave enough to walk down there in front of the whole church, you know. Uh, and I counted that as my salvation. I relied on that experience, but I had no commitment to Jesus or the church then. I just thought because I walked down front, I was saved. So 20 years ago in 1999, a friend of mine, when I worked at uh, Gibbs, invited me to church at Roberts Missionary Baptist Church. And that's when I heard these words, and I knew I was not saved. So if you would, in, in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your, your name and cast out demons in your name and, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And Jesus continues to say, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So in that moment, when I heard those words preached, I was devastated. And I knew in that moment I was lost. And I, I really didn't know what to do, so... Uh, I didn't go down front when the invitation came, I know that, and I, I spoke to the pastor uh, after the service, and we went over into a uh, Sunday school room, and that's the day I received Christ. So, uh, maybe today you're finding yourself convicted, and maybe you're asking yourself this question, what if I die today? And if you're not asking that question, I am. Where would you go if you left this earth today? But this church here, you know, we are a gospel-centered church. And that's the good news. And that's what the gospel says, is the good news. And it says that there is a God, and this God is supreme. It says God is perfect, all-powerful, holy, and just. This God does not tolerate sin, though. 
And he created us and, and the earth to be perfect, but we messed it up. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, when they fell, we inherited that sin, and we were born sinners. So if you're alive, you've sinned against God. All of us deserve dead, and we will never deserve life or salvation. And sin carries a penalty that we cannot pay. But the good news is, is God had a plan, and God sent his son Jesus to pay our sin debt. Jesus is God and man, and he lived a perfect life on earth and was the only one good enough to pay our debt. Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross that we may have life. This is the only way back to God, through Jesus, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the good news is, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So as we start wrapping up today, that's the thing I would tell you to do. is just If, if you know you're lost, if you're feeling conviction, cry out to Jesus. Tell him. You know, repent of your sins and place your trust in Jesus Christ. And commit your life to him. So we're about to have a time of response. Um, and maybe you don't know Jesus. And maybe you want to come down here and talk about it. I'll be down here. I know we have other elders in the room that would love to talk to you and um, just other people in this church that would love to talk to you. So if you have questions or, or concerns, don't be shy. Just, just come on down. I'll be right here. Um, and again, maybe you are str uh, a struggling Christian. Maybe you're struggling with commitment. Maybe you're struggling with something else. I'm here to talk about that too. Um, you know, the Christian life, it's a battle. And we don't always win. Uh, but God honors that fight that we're in. You have to remember, it's, it's progress, not perfection. So we're not on this journey alone. And I would just, uh, just invite you to come up here. So I'd ask the musicians to come on up. Um, and as the music plays... If you want to come, come down here. So uh, let's just let us pray. Father God, I do thank you, Lord.